there are any comments or questions about anything that you hear tonight, please ask when the service is over, and I'd be happy to address those. Uh, if you want to study further on a specific topic or anything that you hear, uh, that is perfectly fine. I volunteer myself to do so. Hope that you've all come prepared and uh, familiar with the, the text, Acts 3, verse 25. We've been going over the book of Acts for some time. We've been doing these verse-by-verse -verse studies uh, on Sunday evenings for quite a while. Uh, we started in the book of Revelation, and we, we, start, uh, we then went to Romans, and then we went to Hebrews. Uh, and we're now in the book of Acts. We'll continue through the New Testament, Lord willing. And we'll continue to study, and, and at, at some point in the future, we'll have every New Testament verse analyzed. That's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to continue to try to keep refreshing our minds with this information over and over and over. As long as we're in these specific books, we're going to continue to look back on what we've learned so far. And hopefully, that will keep it fresh in our minds so that we are better prepared uh, to know what the truth is, to apply it in our lives, and to, at times, if needed and when necessary, to defend the truth. So thank you for that. Thank you for this opportunity. Book of Acts. Uh, we talked a little bit about that this morning. We were in Acts 26, 18 this morning. Uh, so you'll probably hear a very similar lesson to what you heard this morning in Acts 26 and 18 when we get there on the study. Uh, it'll be very similar, I'm sure. Uh, maybe I'll learn something between now and then and we can, uh, we can improve on it. Uh, in the book of Acts, we know that this is a different kind of book. We know that this is a book written by Luke. It was written to Theophilus. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, he is writing. Uh, we know the time frame of the book. Uh, we know that this, uh, the events of the book took place uh, the same uh, time that our Lord ascended to the Father. We know that this is the same time frame as the end of Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. We know that these are uh, the same kind of time frame here. So what we have is we have uh, uh, an eyewitness testimony, eyewitness account of the birth of the church and in the first 30 years until Paul is imprisoned in Rome. So basically, you just have 30 years of church history. And the really important thing that we have is uh, in this is, is we have an inspired eyewitness account. We have an inspired testimony of what folks did to be saved then. And we know that it's still true today. We have all of the information, as we always mention, we have background information to various epistles that we have that really clear up a lot of texts that some people find difficult. Are there difficult texts in Scripture? Absolutely, there are. Uh, but some of them aren't as difficult as we make them by simply not having the knowledge uh, and the study habits uh, to understand the background. And again, what I, when I say background, here's what I mean. <clears throat> when Paul was writing to those in Corinth, Paul had already visited Corinth before he wrote the letter. And Paul visited Corinth. We actually have that account in Acts 18. So we know that Paul was there with them at this time. So when we read the epistles by Paul to Corinth, that's 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we know background information because we have Acts 18. And Acts 18, he, he gives you some information there that help you with the epistle itself. Right? So again, we, we always use the example... <clears throat> Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, but you've been washed and sanctified and justified uh, by the Spirit of our God. And the question is not what do you think it means, but how would they understand it? How would they understand it who've, who've obeyed the gospel and were baptized into Christ upon the preaching of Paul? How would they get it, right? So it's so important for us to pick up these good study habits. And when we, when we look at phrases and words, just because everybody uses a phrase a certain way doesn't make it the way that it was meant. The Bible will tell you how it's meant if you just allow it to, right? And sometimes it does take some extra effort, but I promise you it's worth it. It's worth it. Dig deep in there. Don't be afraid to dig. Don't be afraid of what you'll find. We ever sung that song, Quits Prince of Jesus? Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling? Come follow me. Guess what? If Jesus, through his inspired word, leads you away from what you believe, that's okay. Follow Jesus. Follow his word. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be honest and objective. And we're supposed to come to a good working knowledge uh, uh, of these things and make application to it. Um, sometimes we've been wrong on things in the past. And when we've been wrong on certain things and we realize the truth, what do we do? Well, we'll abandon that. We'll, we'll, we'll conform, right? That's what we're supposed to do. That's the bad thing about our denominational friends. They're so hard-headed. They're so just stuck in one thing. No, I won't listen to anything because Mama loved this church. If Mama loved this church, I don't care what the truth is. That's, that's not even reasonable. But we still have to deal with it. So I'm, I'm urging you, please, give the book of Acts a, st a good uh, study. Learn it thoroughly. Learn it thoroughly. Again, you know, uh, the conversation I had just the other day about Ephesians 
and the background being in Acts 19, and, and the brother would say, well, unless you know uh, when Acts 19 took place or when the book of Ephesians was written, I don't see how it could help you. And I'm like, well, I do know when it was written, and I do see how it can help you, and I'm baffled that you are supposedly a preacher and you don't know this. It's not hard. That is not any, uh, that is not any meaty subject. That's very easy to ascertain. Paul's missionary journeys. You ever heard that term before? I could ask you, pull up fingers, how many were there? Everybody knows there's three. You know that there are pretty good, accurate dates for those three? And guess where Ephesus falls in Acts 19 on the third one? And guess what that was before, him writing to Ephesus? You see, that's not hard. Paul didn't get uh, Acts, the events of Acts 19 took place before the events of Acts 28 when Paul actually gets to Rome to the prison cell where he wrote the book of Ephesians. That doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do we need that information? Absolutely we do. Because you and I, we human beings, we're very, you know, we're very prone to uh, making assumptions about things that really there's no reason to assume. We've got all this information, and it's right here. All we've got to do is study it, right? So just be careful, please. Do yourself a favor and be diligent in your studies. So Acts 1, we understand time frame, right? Synonymous, uh, basically the same time as the, the Great Commission, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Same time frame because uh, Luke records that he was with his disciples for 40 days. So him being with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, that is a reference to the time in which Jesus gave the Great Commission. So that's the time frame. We know the promise. Again, it's so enlightening to me. Whenever you do word studies on certain words and phrases, do a word study of the word promise in the New Testament. Yes, there are several, but which one is this? And, and right again, well, I, I thought it was this. Well, just see what the Bible says about it. So the promise pertains to power, verse 8. The power promised by God in John 14 through 16 to his disciples, not to you. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. 50 days after the Passover, right? Penta, 5, 50 days. The day of Pentecost was fully come and these individuals are there. And the Holy Spirit, as was promised, reference Galatians 3, the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13, there's only one promise of the Holy Spirit. And, and that is uh, what these men receive. And it, uh, this power does something. This is not the Holy Spirit himself as the promise. It is a promise from him. And this allows them to do something. It empowers them to preach an inspired message. And there is confirmation with power. Reference Mark 16, 17 through 20. Now do you realize that Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Mark 16, 17 through 20? Do you know that? That this is the inception, the beginning of the fulfillment of God working with them, confirming the word with signs. These, these tongues, it was both a revelation and a confirmation of the message. What did Peter preach? Hey guys, you don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it for you. Hey fellas, say the sinner's prayer. You're saved. Jesus, why do we need to talk about him? Oh no, Peter starts at Joel. And he goes, Joel, David... And then he, he gives it to them, speaking of Jesus, and they crucified him. What's the result? Man, you really got us. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Right? So we understand Acts 2 and its implications. This is the inception of the kingdom. Chapter 3. Into our hands the gospel is given. We just participated in that song. This is the gospel in action. Acts 3. Beginning in Acts 3 through the end of the book of Acts, <clears throat> it is the church going forth. And that's what they do. Peter and John, they go into the temple and they are now preaching to these Jewish folks about Jesus Christ whom they crucified. And yes, he performs a miracle and it gets their attention of the lame man. And then he begins to preach to them. And then we look at those really interesting verses, verses 18 19, 20, and 21. So we're going to look at those. Uh, and after Brother Lee reads this up here for us, then we'll move on to the next slide. So all this is is Acts 3, 18 through 25. That's all it is. So if you'll turn to Acts 3, you've got the same stuff i got here. Brother Lee? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but those things, verse 18, which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled... 
You know, we could say the same thing that we do so often as we walk through these uh, when we're talking about stuff. We could stop right there. But those things which God before had showed, period. Oh, it says God showed. That means it must be a dream. No, -uh, keep reading. He showed by the mouth of his prophets. He showed by his inspired word. Did you know in the Hebrews, in the epistle to the Hebrews, in Hebrews 12 and verse 15, the Hebrews writer would tell you how the Holy Spirit bears witness. For the Holy Spirit himself is witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. What, what's, what is the Hebrews writer doing? He's quoting Jeremiah 31. The Holy Spirit bore witness of this truth through the inspired teaching of Jeremiah. Well, it says the Holy Spirit bear, bore witness, so can't I just assume how that's done? Absolutely not. Why don't you just let the Bible tell you? God showed. Well, how did he show? It must have been a dream, a vision. Uh-uh. He showed through the inspired teaching of the prophets. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Everybody understands repentance, right? Sometimes people get repentance mixed up with the fruits of repentance. Repentance isn't literally changed conduct. Repentance is literally a changed mind. It's changed will. Matthew 21 and verse 28, A certain man had two sons, and he saith unto the younger son, Go now and work today in my vineyard. And he said, I will not. But later he repented and went. Him going wasn't repenting. Him changing his mind was repenting, and then his actions, what? Also changed. So repentance, ultimately, is a change in will. I go from disobedience to obedience. I go from living for me to realizing the truth and changing my mind about that and living for God. So repent ye therefore and be converted. Be converted is active upon them. To be baptized is passive. You are allowing yourself to be baptized, although it's your decision. But be converted is they must make the change. And, of course, the change involves, obviously, baptism. Because what Peter says here is essentially what he says in Acts 2.38. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out for the remission of sins. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, a really good argument could be made that that times of refreshing is a reference to Acts 2.38b, that being the gift of the Holy Ghost, the miraculous. However, I would favor the view that the times of refreshing, this breath of recovery, would be a time in which reconciliation was accomplished through Christ in the name of the resurrected Savior. Verse 20. And he shall send Christ, that is, he will send Christ in our yet future at the end of this age. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive into the restitution, the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So the times of restitution are equal to the times of uh, refreshing, that is, a restoration of fellowship between God and man through the preaching of Christ. For Moses truly said, verse 22, when you see a word like for at the beginning of a verse, what do you do? For, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me look back, right? If I walk up to you and say, but, you're going to be like, what are you talking about? We haven't, we haven't even had a conversation yet. How are you going to begin with but? For, what do you do? Look back. So, these times of restitution were spoken by the mouth of the prophets. And the quote here comes from Deuteronomy 18 where Moses spoke of Jesus and what would be made possible through him. So we know that we're right. We know that we're on the right track because we keep it in all its context and all the cogs fit together perfectly. Verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed. We talked about that and how hell is eternal. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel to those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. We went back and looked at several of those, right? Last week. Verse 25 says, Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. What a wonderful reference. Do you know that Abraham was very highly revered by these individuals? Abraham and Moses were two of the most highly revered individuals uh, to the Jewish nation that had ever lived. And to say that you were a child of Abraham, that was said with pride. Now, Paul mentions something interesting in Romans 9, 6. He says, for not all Israel are of Israel. 
Obviously saying the same thing that John would say in Matthew chapter 3 as the Pharisees and all would come to John's baptism and he would call them a generation of vipers and demand that they bring forth fruits meet for or worthy of repentance. And he would say, don't think that you can look to your father Abraham for God can of these stones raise children. The point he's making there is, is you Jews can no longer look to your physical lineage. You need something greater, stronger, deeper, and spiritual. You don't just need a, a, some, some DNA or genetics. You need something more. And then that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 9, 6. They are not all of Israel or all Israel who are of Israel. Just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of Abraham. And he goes on to emphasize the difference between Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, of course, was blessed because uh, in the grand scheme of things, he was a more spiritually minded individual. He humbled himself before God and Esau, of course, did not. So the difference is, the difference is contingent upon man's humility towards God. And that's the difference in all Israel not being Israel. While being physically related, the only children of God are the obedient now. And this is what we're talking about here. Ye, he's speaking to the children of Abraham physically. He's speaking to the Jewish nation. In John 8, 31, Jesus would speak to this nation. By the way, if you want to read a harsh rebuke by the mouth of the greatest man that has ever walked the earth, read John 8. He doesn't cut them any slack. Calls them the ch children of the devil. He asks them to accuse him of sin. He puts them up one side and walks them down the other. He gets them good because they deserved it. Jesus, yes, he was gentle, wasn't he? But there were times when Jesus needed to be very direct, and he was at times. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, saying, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed physically, but ye seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now he will go on from this point and he will say that you're not of Abraham. How could he possibly say you're not of Abraham when he just said you're Abraham's seed? The exact explanation I just gave you. You're his physical seed, but you're not his children because you don't act like Abraham acted, which was what? Humble and submissive to the will of God. So do you notice the difference in that? Children of the prophets. When we look back in the Old Testament, we need a, we, we need a working knowledge of that. And, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, I, I don't study the Old Testament as much as I ought to. Uh, I don't study it as much as I do the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I remember when I had that study with those uh, two Mormons for two weeks, and then they brought the third guy along the third week. And we were studying. And the first study, uh, they asked to see my Bible, and it was this one here, and I handed it to them. And they were looking through the New Testament, and there are notes everywhere. And then they got to the Old Testament. And there's a few here and there, but there's not as many. And they're like, what, you don't like the Old Testament? I was like, no, I, I like the Old Testament just fine, but my law is the New Testament. Therefore, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be extremely familiar with the New Testament, and then I'm going to obviously study the Old. But I, I do put a little emphasis on the New because that's my standard. That's my law. And the Old Testament is for my learning. Now, again, we mentioned this morning, you do need a good working understanding of the Old Testament. So I'm just going to ask you a question here. Primarily in the Old Testament times, who are the prophets of? Were the prophets these uh, typically Gentiles or these, these folks outside of the covenant? Of, of God at this time or were they inclusive of the covenant generally speaking they were they were inhabitants they were the seed of Abraham weren't they they were descendants of Abraham Elijah the Tishbite uh, uh, Tishbe was in upper Galilee that was in Palestine there so he was one of the 12 tribes uh, Amos was of Tekoa a herdsman same concept there David and Solomon, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, they were all of, of the same nationality they were all uh, descendants of Jacob and his 12 sons weren't they the point Peter makes is he wants to emphasize that they ought to listen to their kinsmen because their kinsmen spoke of the one they crucified. Ooh, that's pretty tough, isn't it? That's pretty harsh. And Peter gives it to them just like that. And the covenant which God made with our fathers. Did God make a covenant with Abraham? Sure did. Was that the Mosaic law? Nope. But it led to the Mosaic Law, didn't it? 
And the Mosaic law was actually part of the covenant with Abraham uh, to bless his children. But before Moses came on the scene, this is where we get our friends, especially our Seventh-day Adventist friends. Because our Seventh-day Adventist friends will tell you that the Sabbath day was given from eternity. Now here's what you can do if you'd like. You can peruse, no let's not say that. You can do a cursory search from Genesis to Exodus chapter 16. And guess what you're not going to find? Any observance of the Sabbath day. Do you know why? Because it wasn't given to observe until Exodus 16. It wasn't observed by Adam in the garden. It was never observed by Abraham. The Sabbath was never from eternity. And no Genesis 2-7 uh, does not teach that. Uh, the text in Genesis says that God hallowed and sanctified that day. That may be the wrong verse. But it's the first few verses of Genesis 2. He hallowed and sanctified that day. But he didn't tell you when he hallowed or sanctified it. I could tell you when he hallowed and sanctified it. He hallowed and sanctified it after he brought the Egyptian or the, the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage because that was the entire point of the Sabbath. Now, all you got to do now is read Deuteronomy 5, 13 through 15, three verses, and you'll see exactly when and why the Sabbath was given. And it had everything to do with the Exodus and them to remember that God released them from bondage that they themselves couldn't be free of. So how could he have done that before the Exodus? Well, he didn't. But see, again... We need to know these things so that we can help our friends clear up these misunderstandings. The covenant that God made with Abraham. Let's go back to Genesis 15 for a moment. James mentions this in James 2, by the way. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Do you remember this in Genesis 15? When we were going over to Genesis, uh, what was 15 about? Assurance. The entire chapter, God appears in Abraham to a vision. And he gives him assurance about his question concerning his lineage. Look at this one in Genesis 22. After Isaac had been offered, or in the process of Isaac being offered. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. And he said, by myself have I sworn. Now, who said that? And the angel of the Lord. The angel said, by myself, this angel must be somebody pretty special. Have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. <clears throat> Genesis 15, the iteration of the land promise. Genesis 22, the blessing that would come through Christ and the most important blessing. The land promise was temporal and typical in nature. That is, it was meant to teach. It was meant to foreshadow. Then it would be given later to Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 5, and Moses called all Israel. And said unto them, you know when the book of Deuteronomy was written? The book of Deuteronomy is essentially the last month of, Abraham, or of Moses' life. He's already uh, brought them out of Egyptian bondage. They've wandered in the wilderness and they're just about to cross in the land of Canaan. But because of Moses' rebellion in Numbers 22, God will not allow that. So it's the last month and Moses is emphasizing yet again the importance of submission to God. And the events of Deuteronomy 5 come after the events of Exodus 16. And Moses called all Israel and said, Hear, all Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now, Horeb is just another word for Sinai. Horeb and Sinai are the same places. Guess where Horeb and Sinai aren't? Jerusalem. Reference Isaiah 2, verse number 3. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, <clears throat> but even with us, even us who are here this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount of the midst of the fire. That's Exodus 18. I stood between, between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Is anybody in Deuteronomy 5 right now in your Bibles? Look down to verses 13 through 15, please. 
The Sabbath was given to cause them to remember God removing them from Egyptian bondage to these specific people. Not everybody, not Gentiles, Jews. After the Exodus, it couldn't have possibly been before. Saying to Abraham, that's why we mentioned Abraham first in our study this evening. Ultimately, the covenant with this nation began with the promise to Abraham, though Abraham never actually saw the fulfillment of it. Back in Genesis 15, let's go back for just a moment, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. Where was that, by the way? We're following along. That's Egypt, right? And shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge. Now this is interesting because the events of Genesis 15, if my math is right, and, and, and I discussed with uh, Sonia and Kevin's lovely granddaughter how math isn't my favorite subject, but if my math is somewhat correct here, Abraham came about 2,000 years after creation. And the events that we're talking about here this nation, the removal of Exodus, Abraham would come some 400 years, or 450, or excuse me, Moses would come some 400 years after Abraham, and then there would be a space, uh, or excuse me, let me get this right. Uh, see, I told you math, what my strong suit. Abraham was 2,000 years after creation. Then you had about 400 years of captivity, and then, of course, the events of Exodus 3 come along where Moses begins the process of leading them out, right? So you have about that 400-year period. That fulfills what we're going to read here in verse 16. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. But the point I wanted to make a moment ago was the events that are spoken of in Genesis 15, 2,000 years after creation. He's talking about things hundreds Hundreds of years in the future. And he with great detail tells you exactly what will happen. And guess what? It did. Now we know why the prophet says that God who calleth the end from the beginning. God who knoweth all things. Have you ever considered how God views time? We talk about this all the time, don't we? You ever considered that? You and I view time spatially, don't we? We're in time. So we can only look forward and back and we can't actually see anything except in memory or in anticipation. God is not bound by time. So if you would, if you can imagine that this wall is the timeline uh, of all creation, God can see Cain killing Abel right now just as easily as he can see the very last second of this universe. And he doesn't see it as he is bound by. He can view any point at any time and that's how he knows all things. He's not bound as we are. He's a being outside of and greater than time and space. So sometimes when we think about God, we've got to make sure we think about Him properly. He isn't bound like you and I are. He's completely boundless. And He sees all of these things with perfect clarity. So could He say to Abraham, 2,000 years after creation, in a few hundred years, this is what's going to happen. And guess what? It happened exactly like He told it. That shouldn't shock anybody, should it? In thy seed shall all nations be blessed. What does that mean? Peter in this text, Acts 3.25, he quotes Genesis 22.18. In thy seed refers to the Savior coming from Abraham's actual physical genes. Not J-E-A-N-S. But G-E-N-E-S, right? Abraham didn't wear jeans, but he had jeans. So he actually came from Abraham. He was of his actual lineage. So when we're talking about the seed of Abraham, we're talking that Jesus, the eternal word, was clothed in flesh, but not just any flesh. He would be of a very specific lineage. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed which is Christ. So the fulfillment of Genesis 22.18 is Galatians 3.16. Hebrews 2, if you remember the Hebrews class or the, the sermons, Hebrews 2 emphasized Jesus' superiority because of his role as what? Redeemer. Do you know what that required of him? Humanity. 
For as much then as children are made partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In other words, he was an actual mortal. He was an actual man of the lineage of Abraham. Thus fulfilling Genesis twenty two eighteen. 18. Why did he have to be a human? So that he could die for us. This physical incarnation is how he would be made lower than the angels. You ever wondered about that? We talked about that. You remember that? There's only one way in which Jesus was ever made anything. John eight fifty eight says, Before Abraham was, I am. Denoting eternal deity but Jesus was made in one sense and that at some point the eternal word left heaven and was planted in a physical body thus being made that doesn't mean he began his existence there but he continued his eternal existence in a fleshly temporal body that's how he is made lower than the angels God glorifying him for Jesus efforts on earth is how he would obtain a more excellent name being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance. That's, that's not a, a mistake that the Holy Spirit put the word inheritance in there. Because it looks directly at the lineage of Abraham. And the physical incarnation of Christ. And by this inheritance he obtained a more excellent name than they. Who are they? Angels. You mean to tell me he was made lower than the angels, yet he obtained a more excellent name? How in the world did that happen? Jesus has only ever obtained this one way. When we talk about deity, we talk about deity knowing all things, right? So he's never obtained any information. Jesus obtained a great name, not because of deity, but because of his role as redeemer. Again, pointing right back to his incarnation. You have no idea how deep the book of Hebrews is into the physical life of Jesus and his physical sacrifice until you really study Hebrews 2. The blessing of all nations is that Jesus made redemption possible for all. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He made it possible to everybody. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. Even we have believed in Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Jesus lived and died in an earthly body so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And we could uh, be a part of this inheritance through his death. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Therefore, excuse me, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, listen, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, what promise is that? That's Abraham's promise that we just looked at. Notice also that the children of this covenant would include first the Jewish nation, Acts 3.26, and later any and all who would obey, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for honor and glory and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. Romans 2, 6 through 11. With that thought in mind, just do me a favor and read the first eight verses of Romans 8 tonight. In light of Romans 2, those who seek glory compared to those who obey unrighteousness. Those who obey righteousness to those who do not. Those who seek for immortality and those who do not. And notice the contrast made in those few verses to help you better understand that chapter. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. To any that have never obeyed the gospel. You must hear the word of God and believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before men. Be baptized for the remission of sins and live faithfully. Walking in harmony with His will. Seeking glory and immortality through well-doing and humble submission to the Lord's will. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful? If not, you can change that here tonight. Acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. He will forgive you. Repent of those things. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. We beseech you, therefore, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God right now as we stand and sing.